All right, Luke chapter number 17, and we'll continue our, our study, and what I'm trying to do, or making an attempt to do, is to show you by uh, illustration of uh, people with different uh, personality traits or qualities or things, and it's not to get you to identify to things. You know, the Lord oftentimes will give you uh, gifts and abilities that you're not aware of, uh, and they don't manifest themselves until they're needed. Um, you're, you're not stuck in one thing. This is important for you to grasp before I get started. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your many blessings and how good you've been to us. And uh, we sure do appreciate having a place to come. Thank you for the freedom to still be able to worship. I pray now that you'll be with us. And Lord, give these folks that have come to church today uh, something more than just, well, I went to church and that's it. And give them something that'll... Uh, move them down a relationship closer to you. Move them down the road a little bit further. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Here's the misconception that happens, and you can you can oftentimes put yourself in a in a box. Uh, there is an identity crisis that is going on and has gone on for years, long before the I want him to be a her and I want her to be a him and he to be a she and she to be a him and them to be a they. And, you know, I choose to be this and I choose to be that and so on and so forth. It rips the thread right out of the fabric of the basics of when you come to Jesus Christ, it's I have to admit I'm a sinner. Amen. And so what we do is, is we kind of dip behind or duck behind trying to label something or compartmentalize things. Well, by taking uh, Briggs-Myers test or whatever else it may be when it comes to uh, psychological, uh, um, uh, I guess you would say evaluation of yourself, it's to figure out, well, what is it that I'm supposed to be and then I'm supposed to fulfill that. We well, have to be very careful about that because you'll aim to be something maybe God doesn't intend for you to be. Suppose the attributes that are there are not good attributes. Well, the Lord tells you to put off the old man and then he gives you a list of those things that are attributed to the old man and to put on the new man and then he gives you a list of things that are attributed to the new man. You're not destined to fulfill what you were created with or what a psychiatrist may try to label you as. If you go to see a doctor like that, they have to work off of what they have and make an evaluation off of what you say or your interpretation of it and use their ability and more, more often than not their experience uh, as well as their education to try as best they can to evaluate you where you are. But over a period of time, think about this, and the majority of you are, are here today that are older, are you the same person when you were 12 years old? <clears throat> I certainly hope not. Have you learned some things? Well, if you're destined to only be whatever it was you were born to be, then you're going to have some serious trouble. Your, your personality changes because of influences. Times change, your pressure changes you. Pressure doesn't make you, it reveals what you are. However, a constant pressure will cause you to have to adapt. In the old days, they had a thing called Stockholm Syndrome. Some of you are aware of, some not. But just listen to the illustration, if you could, please. And what that is, is, is the person that's been taken hostage, this is a simplification of the definition, uh, takes on the, pers the persona or the personality of the person that's holding them. In other words, they empathize or sympathize with that person. Now you think, well, that'd just be absolutely ridiculous. Well, Job says, skin for skin, all that a man hath, he'll give for his life. And so all of a sudden, they actually feel empathy or sympathy for their captor. But at the root of that is, is I'm just trying to preserve myself. And so when I talk to you about these things, it's to help you to do an evaluation, but to recognize this. If I have a problem, oh, let's say I have a problem with gossip. Am I prone, you know, if I'm, oh, well, I've been uh, identified as a gossiper. Well, I'm just going to be a gossiper from now on. That's just how it is. Just, I'm a gossiper. This is how it is. People don't change. If you're going to be a gossiper, you're just going to be a gossiper. Or can I do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me? And can I realize I have the sin of gossip in my life? And that if I ask God to help me change, that he can give me a roadmap to changing. Amen. 
Does that make, is that making sense to you? I was kind of looking for a little feedback there. I wasn't looking for you to, you know, thunderous amen. It's just to help you to understand you're not doomed to be whatever somebody says you are. You have the ability through Christ to change. Now, I don't think that it's just changed by, you know, I can learn to do this. I think without the spiritual component that you are provided by being saved, you have the opportunity to overcome the natural tendencies of the flesh and or the labels that have been placed on you in the period of time that you've been coming up. And uh, I've known grumpy old people to become kind and sweet and generous and those kinds of things. You say, why? Christ's intervention. I've known people that were takers to become givers. I've known people that were combative to wind up being the individuals that will be the first one to, to be helpful to you in those things. So when I point these things out to you, it, it's not to try to put you in a box. It's for all of us to strive to be like Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate goal. But to recognize that throughout history, when you look at these uh, people in the Bible, especially the great patriarchs, that number one, that the Lord uses each of them and their own individual capacities because not everybody has the same ability. Amen. One, of the, one of the surest signs of insecurity is, is that you have to always try to turn people into what you are. Well, then that makes you the gold standard. You might have some really good attributes and you might have some good things, but let me just say this to you. And I just said this recently uh, I, because I was asked the question forthright and so I gave them my answer to it. But they were talking about doing a, a, a pastor school, a preacher school on, uh, on training a second man or on a Timothy is what the deal was, is that how to train a Timothy. Well, here's the caveat in the whole thing. And I told a bunch of preachers that were sitting there at the table, I said, well, uh, let me just say this before we get started. How many of you are training somebody that you picked and how many of them God picked? And then you can see the frowns. And I said, generally, gentlemen, what happens and the reasons that our, quote, Timothys don't work out is, is because everybody's not called to be a Timothy. There is not everyone that's called to be an Elisha. Y'all are, are kind of, you're thinking that's good. I'm, I, that's a good thing. Not everybody's a Joshua. You ever pause to think about Joshua? Joshua was in captivity the whole time Moses is on the backside of the desert. So was Aaron. Aaron didn't go to the backside of the desert with Moses. They were both right there. The Lord waited for 40 years to bring Moses forward. And when he brought Moses forward, you know what happens. Aaron comes in as a mouthpiece. Although if you read Deuteronomy 32, you realize Moses, he says he's not eloquent. <laughs> you ever read Deuteronomy 32? Uh, he's very eloquent. He's just ducking out. But the bottom line is this, Aaron steps in line as a mouthpiece, becomes the high priest there, and Joshua becomes the protege, and Joshua winds up following that boy for 40 years as a Timothy, because he was willing to be nothing but a Timothy. So I asked the guys at the table, I said, I think unfortunately that we pick the Timothy, and you pick who you like to pick. Somebody that's like you, does things like you, talks like you, acts like you, and now you're trying to train somebody to be like you instead of what God would have them to be. Amen. Joshua was nothing like Moses. Now you have, a, you have a difficult time with that. You say, why? Because these things involve God's calling in your life. God made each of you as unique. You realize this, they even know now your teeth are not even the same. Your fingerprints and your toe prints and footprint, they're not the same. You can have 10 feet of snow piled up out here. You won't find one snowflake that's like the other one. I don't know how God does all that. Of all the millions and billions of people living in the face of the earth, and nobody's fingerprints are alike, and their teeth aren't alike, and their toe prints aren't alike, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen. So if that's the case, ladies and gentlemen, God made each of you with unique abilities that sometimes you fall in line with individuals and you think, okay, that's it. But why? The Lord made you that way. It's not an attempt to turn you into sort of gray matter. 
where everybody's just the same. That, that's not, it, you, you can, without being a rebel, you can still be unique to what God called you to do. Amen. There's certain of you, you're good with numbers and you're good with computers and you're good with uh, being able to do stuff. They're uh, up there at this meeting where I just was and there's a couple of kids over there. Man, I'm telling you, they're sitting down there and playing the piano and all that stuff or you get a group, you're ready to sing. I'm, I'm amazed at our kids, they get over here, they hit a note and then they, hmm, hmm, they get the note and then they get up here and they sing on pitch. I don't understand all of that, but they do. Right. Well, wouldn't it be ridiculous to say, well, y'all don't need to do that because I don't do that. Or you know what you do? You have the benefit of people that have talents. Doesn't make anybody better than you. It means that when it comes to that, look, look I, 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 I know enough about a car to take it to the shop when it's broke. It doesn't mean if I call Brother Larry and say the main Ferengator Rod Duma Flitchy Thingamabobby or whatever the deal the, the, in the car and he raises up the hood and he goes, well, there's the main Ferengator Rod and you got this, you do this and that and I'm, I'm <laughs> okay, can you fix it? That's all I care about, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I got to run to the auto parts place and I got to get the Thingamabob Duma Flitchy and it's part number so on and so forth and all that kind of stuff. Doesn't mean he's better than me. It just means I have enough sense to recognize when it comes to cars, he's better than me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it might be different than that if you put him in the pulpit. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm not special because I get things here. I just, God gave me an ability to do that. Yes. Brother Larry's not special. He just, God gave him an ability to do that. Right. Do you see? And you, and you have to learn to accept the fact that just because you're not like somebody else, it doesn't put you lower on the rung. Amen. It just means you're unique in whatever God's given you the ability to do. Yes, Some of you have, uh, you have a, a, a brain. You do a disservice because God gave you a brain and you don't apply yourself. Come on. Because you're lazy. And you ride on your coattails and you got through school without having to do your homework and you got through school without having to apply yourself and you can make the A-B honor roll without having to hardly even crack a book. Well, you're lazy because somebody else has to work at it just to make a C. And you say, what do you want? If I want a worker, I'll take the guy that's willing to work to make the C than somebody who just rides through and rests on what they're doing. If God's gifted you that way, you have a responsibility to apply yourself. Yes, sir. Amen. That's good. But not everybody has the brain you do. And if God gave it to you, here's the issue that becomes, do you apply yourself and use what God gave you for Him? Every one of those fellows I've given you so far, and one I'm going to give you here in just a little while, every single one of those individuals, without question, use their unique ability for God's glory to minister to other people. Is that a fair statement? Yes. But none of them are the same. Moses is not a Paul. Paul's not a Peter. Peter's not a Jeremiah. They're all different. Every one of them. And none of them are sinless. All right, look at this passage here now in Luke chapter number 17. And let me give you just a, a couple of things here before we go, go over here. Uh, the Lord said something unique about himself. Now, he's used to being in charge. Is that a fair statement? He's created an eternity. <laughs> created is a bad word there. He just always was. He wasn't a made being. When was the Lord's beginning? In the beginning. When did that start? Yes. <laughs> it's just always been. He's not, a, he's not a created being. But would you agree he's always been the one to be served? Right? I mean, he's got angels and cherubim and seraphim and everybody to do his bidding and that kind of a thing. All right, now you have to recognize about the Lord. When the Lord comes down here to dwell in the body of flesh and clothe him, himself with flesh, the Bible says he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself a little lower than the angels. He humbled himself and became a, you know the word? A servant. He had to learn to do something that he was not already good at. He learned obedience by having to do something you never do. How does God suffer? You can't make God suffer. He's an eternal being. 
How does God suffer? So what did he do? He put on the clothes of a human being and the Bible said he learned obedience. Obedience to who? He'd never been obedient. If you are the supreme big dog, big kahuna sitting up there in eternity, and, and you're not in obedience to anyone. Right. He learned obedience by what? By the things that he what? Suffered. See, you can learn things. Amen. Don't fall in, ladies and gentlemen, to this trap that, well, just people don't ever change. It's just how they are. That's Calvinism, man. Amen. You're not made that, you can't, uh, uh, made that you can't change. I've known plenty of uh, convicts and stuff that learned their lesson by what they did and become very, very uh, 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 members of society and contributed greatly to that. Have you not ever learned anything from the things you suffered? And you learn after you jumped off a building too high as you got older and break, break something and you realize I've, I learned something by suffering a broken ankle. I'm not jumping off a building anymore. <laughs> Playing Superman. So there's things that you can learn. That's what I want you to understand. You're not doomed to be whatever it is you are. If you have a deficit in your personality, God can train it out of you. But it requires effort. Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, no, it requires effort. And sometimes that effort means suffering. Amen. You mean to touch a tender subject? It's a tender one. It's hard. If you struggle with weight, told you it was tender. If you struggle with weight, it doesn't mean, well, you were just born to be uh, heavy. It means that you have to struggle because your system wants, uh, my system wants, I'll, I'll use me. <laughs> I, I would much rather sit down in the morning and have a cinnamon roll big as my head. <laughs> every mo every, I'd never get tired of it. Every morning. I mean, just got the, the creamy, gooey icing all over it and enough cinnamon, about that thick. Yeah and sitting in melted butter, so it's kind of mopping it up. So you get that sort of salty, sweet mix together. See, my, I'm, I'm salivating. But if I, but if I want to get that under control, you know what I have to do? I have to suffer. Now for some of you, you're sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, man, that sounds horrible. I can't even imagine eating something like that. Okay. But if I have a problem when it comes to that, you know what you have to do? You have to learn to do without. It's suffering. You learn some things. A lady gave me a pan of them. And I asked her, I said, Did you, where's the tape at? She said, the tape. And I said, yeah, the duct tape. She said, for what? I said, I just will go ahead and tape them on. Because <laughs> that's where it's going to go. Yeah. Right? Now, the illustration, do you understand? The illustration is, is that you can learn to get that under control, but it doesn't come without effort. Changes in your way of living, in your personality, don't come without effort. You read uh, 10 pages a day in your Bible, you'll go through your Bible about, oh, maybe it's about 1,200 pages. You'll go through your Bible in about about four times in a year if you just read 10 pages a day. Preacher, I really, I'm, I'm really struggling. I, 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 can't, I can't even get through my Bible. 10 pages, not 10 chapters. 10 pages, if I'm doing it in my head, 10 pages a day will get you through 1,200 pages and you'll get through it at least four times in a year. Some of you have been saved 20, 30, and 40 years. You should have been through the Bible a couple hundred times by now. You're still struggling to get through it once. I said struggling. It requires discipline. Amen. See? It, it's not intended that, you know, well, I need to make a change. I need to give attention more to, to reading. Okay? Then you're going to have to turn off the box. Sure. It's not going to happen without a cost. Right. I don't want to make you think. It's not like salvation. Salvation changes your soul. Right. And changes the destination in eternity. Your mind and your body is not saved. Right, right. Do you ever struggle with bad thoughts? Anybody in here ever struggle with a bad thought at all? Can I get maybe a unanimous amen on that? Amen. 
Okay, well, if that's the case, you wonder, well, if I'm a Christian, why would I think that way? Your mind's not saved. Boy, I'm watching light bulbs go ting, 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 ting. You have to trust what the book says by faith, ladies and gentlemen, about your salvation and eternal security. If you're thinking you're headed for trouble, you say, why? Your mind's not saved. You have to have it washed in the blood and change your way of thinking. And guess what? You do that, and then the next thing happens, like, well, that must not have really worked. It can't have worked. If it had worked, why, when I was praying, did that come up? Because your mind's not saved. That's why he tells you he'll give you the mind of Christ. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that day. You say, why? I've seen a lot of things. And it's like a Blu-ray thumb drive, whatever you want to call it. And then it just decides to pop in whenever it wants to. And I have to discipline that out. I'm as selfish as you are. You find that hard to believe. You don't think, oh, yeah, oh well, he's in pretty good shape because I'm not selfish at all. You know, okay. I'm as selfish as the worst one of you when it comes to certain things. I don't like to go in the restaurant and let everybody else eat first. I don't like to stop at the light and let everybody else go through. What is that, selfish? I want to eat what I want to eat instead of what's best for me to eat. Selfish. I'm selfish as you are. You say, what can happen? I'm trying to train it out. But it takes effort. Do you understand? The Christian life requires sweat. But that thing between your ears, I hate to tell you, and I'm not making fun of your intellect, but it's a soup sandwich. That's why the Lord tells you you need to read, and that's why you have to study. You say, why? Because you have to learn how to act right. Why do you think he wrote you 66 books on it? You know why? Because you don't know how to act. Now, what I've just given you, before I get into this here, what I've just given you will help you when you deal with other people. People have a hard time with surrender. Do you understand? They have a hard time with sacrifice. And you're thinking, why can't they just learn this? What's wrong with them? Their mind's not saved. It takes them a long time. Sometimes, you know what? They don't want to learn and the Lord doesn't force it on him. You have to be willing to let the Lord change you. Are you willing? Amen. You say, well, a preacher doesn't make sense. All right, let me give you a couple of verses. I'm coming to this, but this is too important for you to grab. Some of you, your little lights are, are glowing now. You're like, oh, I, never, I realize my mind's not. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. You're not, your body's not your own, right? You're bought with a price, Right? You don't get to just feed your body whatever you want. Amen. That's good. It's not just about dope and drinking. That's the temple of the Holy Ghost you're walking around in. You don't get to just clothe it how you want to and put it on display how you want to and do with it what you want to. Do you give it enough rest? It's not your body. Do you give it enough exercise? Do you give it enough nutrition? It's not your body. Your tongue's not yours. You present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, sacrifice. I could preach on that a while anyway. It's a reasonable. And be not conformed to this world. He's talking to save people. Well, I've got saved. My mind must have been changed. Why does he tell you not to be conformed to the world? but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It didn't happen when you got saved. You have a responsibility to put your mind on the altar. I have to change how I think. Can I ask you a question? Do you have a problem when you, if I'm going to say this right quick and somebody's going to come to mind, you have a problem with somebody that's in the body of Christ and you don't like them? your mind been transformed? They're in the body. They're part of the family. 
Why are they always on the tip of your tongue? You mean so God didn't change them to your liking? Well, have you changed to God's liking? Maybe that person's there to go, I'll change them as soon as you change you. Be transformed that you may know that which is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So you know what it requires? It requires a transformation. What do I have to do? I got to get my body under control. And its desires and its pleasures and what it wants to do. And what's the accepted norm nowadays? I've heard that term till I'm about ready to throw up. Yeah. Well, this is the new norm. Well, there's some of the old norms that don't need to be new. Amen. Amen. But how you are with other people, you have the mind of Christ. My goodness, you don't pause very long and hard to think about what God has to put up when he's dealing with you. Well, how about you just don't show any more grace toward those people than God's showing with you, okay? I know what you do. You think you've arrived. That's why you're so hard on other people. Because you don't think there's anything God needs to fix with you. I don't like people. You're going to be in heaven with them for eternity. You're going to hit the judgment seat of Christ and the Lord's going to call you in for those things in your heart and say, come on up here. I want to know what you got against your brother, against your sister. Let's have it out right here. Man, have me excused. Y'all are worried about, you know, well, he's going to find out I've been smoking cigarettes and doing this and that and the other. No, you know what? You know what he's going to do? He's going to call you into account for how you treat each other yeah, and what you think of each other. And how you make innuendos about each other. Amen. Should we get everybody? <laughs> and me too. You tend to be cliquish. Because you get comfortable that way. If, if it was bothering God as much as it's bothering you, then he'd change it, wouldn't he? Has he changed it? Must not be as big a God that bother to God as it is to you. I mean, he's God, isn't he? You think you'd be happy if God fixed it how you thought it ought to be fixed? You sure you know the end of that? You want that responsibility? Suppose God did that. Can I ask you this question? Do you not think something else would crop up on your screen? You ain't never happy. You gripe all the time. Why? Because people aren't like you. Amen. And ain't none of us like him. Amen. So what do you have to do? You have to learn that's God's business. Shut your mouth and pray. I got a list of things. I didn't read them to you last week, but I got a list of things. Uh, do you pray for those individuals as much as you talk about them? I mean, pray for them. You pray for God to bless them or God to kill them? I'm just asking you. It's just us. It's, an, it's, re, it's inside. No, you don't have to answer. He's like, oh, yes. If I had you uh, raise your hand and say the right answer to that, would you be able to raise your hand and not be lying to God? Ever wonder why they get under your skin so bad? Maybe you've forgotten what you really are. You say what? A saved animated dirt ball. Last, before I get into this passage in Luke chapter number 17, they have a thing called a God complex. And in the God complex, it's an individual who sees himself as God and feels like he knows what everybody else ought to be doing, how they ought to be doing, the way they ought to be doing, and et cetera, et cetera. I've seen that in independent Baptist churches for all the years I've been pastoring. You want to be God and fix everybody's life.
God doesn't even impose on their free will to change them even if it's best for them. Who are you, God? I can't preach this stuff in other places. They're not mature enough to be able to take it. This is far and beyond smoking and drinking and cussing and chewing and watching Netflix and all the other kind of junk that you, you know, oh, that's not a big deal and all that kind of a thing. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I scroll the, the Twitter and I have the Facebook and I, you know, I, oh, we, we way beyond that, man. That's kid stuff. Yeah. You ever ask yourself why it is that people irritate you so bad, the ones he died for? You ever ask yourself why it's always them instead of saying, you know something, Lord, I, I wonder if I took that much interest in my own life and pointed out the wrong in my own life, if I'd even have time to find the wrong in others' lives. That's a hard truth, isn't it? Sure it is. It's a difficult thing. It's the hardest thing in the world to learn as a pastor that you might see what's going on and all you can do is present truth and leave it alone. You can't you can't force change. And no matter how much you harp on it, ladies and gentlemen, you can't force change. You're trying. Why is it the topic of your conversation? All right, Luke 17. Now, If the Lord, excuse me, if the Lord saw fit to become a servant, do you think maybe that's a good goal for us to aim at? <clears throat> you have two boys there, and the mom's pretty bold, and the mother of uh, James and uh, John there, and she comes up to the Lord one day, they're the sons of thunder, and she comes up to him and she says, uh, Lord, now I want to ask you a, a favor if I could, please. And he, she, he says, yeah, what can I do for you, sister? She says, uh, when my boys come into the kingdom, uh, or when you come into the kingdom, I want my boys to sit on the right hand and the left hand. I mean, you have to think about all the choices that he would have of who to sit on the right hand and the left hand, including the Old Testament patriarchs. But he says, you want to sit on the right hand and the left hand. You know what he says to those boys? He turns around to the boys and he says, is that what you want to do? Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we sit on the right hand, sit on the left hand. He said, can you... Uh, have the baptism I'm about to have and drink the cup I drink? Sure, yeah, no problem at all. <laughs> you know what he just said? He's talking about taking on the personification of sin. <laughs> but you see, they, they think, oh, I, sure, I can, I can take care of that. Oh, I can even die. Oh, it's a whole lot more than just dying. Yeah. So in the passage here, ladies and gentlemen, the Lord said that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but to become a servant by humbling himself. But here's the problem. Step number one before I come to this passage right here is, is how do you see yourself? How do you view yourself? It doesn't make a difference. He's God manifest in the flesh, but he sees himself as a servant. I don't want to be a servant. I want to be served. That's not natural, Right? Servant doesn't even get paid, doesn't even get recognized. In the passage right here I'm fixing to show you, he's not even named, not set aside by a certain identity. He's just a servant. That's all, nothing. You get over there in the Old Testament, you got a boy by the name of Naaman. He's the captain of the guard. He's a big dog over there and he's got leprosy and stuff. And while that little old woman is in Syrian uh, captivity, she said, well, I wish you could meet the preacher over there. His name's Elisha, man. He could really help you out. He's a great guy. Boy, she's bragging on him and stuff like that. And he finds out about it and he has to wind up going over there to do that. You know what she's called? She's just called a little maid. You don't even know her name. There's a woman over there called the great woman of Shunem. What's her name? <laughs> you ever read in your passage uh, in, uh, in uh, the Gospels there, you go into Mark chapter number uh, five and you come down through there. Why even the demon possessed man's named and the little girl dying's named, but the woman with the issue of blood, what's her name? There's no name. 
See, a servant's not recognized or identified or set apart by uh, all that they do. They're just a servant. That's all. But you know what the Lord said to those two boys? He said, you want to be the greatest in the kingdom? Well, who don't want to be the greatest? <laughs> sure, we want to be the greatest. <laughs> well, if you want to be the greatest, you have to be the least. And if you want to be the master, you got to be the servant. That's an oxymoron, don't you think? And that twisted up. That doesn't even make sense. You ever been in a church where everybody sees himself as a servant? We ain't died yet. <laughs> you don't have people come into church with uh, John Kennedy's word. It's not what the, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. <laughs> they come into the church. What's the church going to do for me? What are you going to do for the church? Changes the picture, doesn't it? Nowadays, you know, I'm hearing all the stuff we're building over here. Well, you have to have this, and you have to have this, and you have to have this, and you have to have this. I'm not talking about building codes. If you expect people to come and you expect people to stay, you have to be able to provide certain things and this and that and the other and so on and so forth. There you go. That's the modern church. What do you have to offer? Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen. I have a pew you can sit on. Well, how about programs? I have a Bible to preach. What about stuff? Got to do things. Stuff. See, before long, what happens is, is the whole thing is knit together by all the things you do because you think you're holding it together. Well, if you just have all this, you know, that's hooks. You got to be careful. That's what they do at the movie theater to keep you coming. That's what they do at Walmart and at all the places of business to keep you coming. That's why they run specials to keep you coming, to keep you coming, to keep you coming. If you're only coming because of what they can do for you, you're going to run into a train wreck. The church is, what can I do? What would you have me to do? But you don't see that much anymore. I'm not getting on to you. I'm just giving you some information. You can, you know, smoke them if you got them. I mean, I have nothing. I can't force it into you. I'm far and removed from the fact that no matter how much entertainment you have, you're going to be able to draw more people. And then you know what happens? If I use something, some gimmick to draw them in, I'm going to have to keep getting another gimmick, get another gimmick, get another gimmick, get another gimmick, get another gimmick. Get another gimmick. I'm too old for gimmicks. Yeah. I ain't swallowing no goldfish and having some... Hoochie Coo Dancer dropped down out of an airplane and parachute and all that kind of junk. I'm not doing that. I'm not having bubbles up here and laser shows and smoke coming out of the platform and make some kind of big thing with billboards and about series of sermons that are going to be preaching all that. You say, what are we going to do? The same stuff we've been doing now for 34 years. The same stuff. Well, preacher, like, well, y'all are here. Y'all must be boring people. <laughs> you don't come for anything else but that. That's what church is about. Amen. But do you see yourself as a servant? Or the one being served? The Lord has some people come in there and he gets them ready to sit down at the uh, table. And when he comes in there, the individuals walk in the door and say, you know, where's the, the, the high dollar room? Where's the, where's the VIP classroom? Where's the place like that? You know what the Lord says to those guys? It might be better if you sit at the lowest room and if the guy comes to get you and take you, that's good. But don't walk in thinking that's what you're going to get. I got to read you one passage. I've already shot through 45 minutes here just shooting off my mouth. Your mindset matters. Ladies and gentlemen, if you did not see yourself as any more than a servant, you know how hard it would be to offend you? If you're just a servant, I don't deserve to be talked to any other way than that. And he said, the disciples, it's impossible that offenses, offenses will come and see a, a but woe unto them through whom they come. Better for him, millstone be hung about his neck and cast into the depths of the sea, into the sea than to offend one of the little ones. 
Take heed to yourself, the brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times, I'm in verse four in a day, seven times in a day, turn again and forgive him, and I repent, thou shalt forgive him. The apostle said unto him, unto the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if he had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root and planted in the sea, and it should obey you. Saying, it only takes a little bit of faith. What's the problem? He's showing them how they lack faith because of their inability to forgive one another. Some of you are carrying uh, things that happened to you 15, 20 years ago. They are marked events on your calendar and you have, you know what he says? You don't even have the faith of the grain of a mustard seed because you can't forgive them. And you're Christ-like? Amen. Well, you say you are. You lack faith. Well, which of you having a servant, uh-oh, plowing and feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come from the field, go sit down to me. And will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward that thou shalt eat and drink. In other words, the servant's been out working, and then he comes in, and he asks you to take care of him before he uh, takes care of you. You see the picture, right? And will not rather say, to, I mean, I'm sorry, verse number nine, doth he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not, I don't think so. Now, now think about this a minute. Preacher, I've done what God said to do. Okay. Where's my gratitude? Where's my thanks? You've done what you were told to do? Doth he thank him for doing what he was told to do? Look at the passage. I'm not lying to you. I've done what you told me to do. Doth he thank that servant? I trow not. I don't think so. Why? He's only done what he was told to do. He didn't do anything exceptional. He just did what he was told to do. Well, preacher, you, you, you're preaching. That's what I was told to do. Yeah. Amen. Preacher, you know, the Lord should be thankful. I'm just doing what I'm told to do. But when you do what you're told to do, you think they're going to throw out a banner and have the party and the streamers and all the other stuff? Because, you know, I, I did what I was told to do. I think it's coming across as a rebuke. It's not intended to. It's just, but I'm not feeling the love this morning. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm running over time. Go spell the ladies in the nursery. Verse 10. So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you. That's a big word all. But look what he said. First of all, don't expect somebody to be thankful, but now you get to add to it. Here's what I want you to say. We are, but I did what you told me to do. Okay. And the Lord said, here's what you say about yourself. I'm an unprofitable servant. Why? I think he said, we did what our, was our duty. duty. I just did my job. You ever have a business and your boss tells you to do some things and you come back in and go, hey, boss, I did what, what you told me to do. Okay. Well, I mean, don't you appreciate that? Did you do what I asked you to do? Yes, sir. Okay, that's your job. But I mean, I, but I did it. You're supposed to do it. Well, aren't you going to give me a certificate? No, I'll give you a paycheck at the end of two weeks. 
or a pink slip if you don't continue to do what I told you to do. You sure you want to be a servant? I'm just doing my job. Do you expect to be thanked for it? Well, sure. It must be a misprint. I, I must be reading it wrong. Because y'all are looking at me like a tree full of owls. You're, well, surely you have to... <clears throat> I didn't say it wasn't nice or courteous or whatever to tell somebody thank you. But you know what it said? I, I, you, you, you did what you're supposed to do. But then your response is supposed to be, I've done that which was my duty to do. But that says a lot about the servant. Because at least he did his duty. Have you? If the first thing in your mind that just rang out right there was, I can name five people that aren't doing their duty, you got a problem. I do mine, they don't do theirs. It's your job to do yours. It is not your job to be concerned about theirs. <laughs> 